Hi, I'm Ron Johnson, President and CEO for the Boys and Girls Clubs of Monterey County. Thank you for joining us today for our first ever virtual summer culinary event benefiting the club's nutrition program. Today, we're honored to have award-winning chef Bert Catino from the Sardine Factory, along with his executive sous chef, Pete Martinez. They're here to showcase some of the signature dishes from the Sardine Factory. I'd like to thank Chef Catino, the Sardine Factory, Cannery Row Company, and Ted Balistrieri for making today's event possible. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. We're so grateful for your support. Every dollar raised from today's event will go toward the club's nutrition program. And with that, I'll hand it over to Chef Bert. Bert, take it away. This is an educational value, and we hope that you enjoy it. And uh, just to let you know, this restaurant's been here for 52 years. Unfortunately, we're closed right now because of you know what's happening. But we are going to have two tents outside, and we're going to open for lunch. I haven't been open for lunch for 30 years, so I might as well open up. The aquarium's closed, and we'll see how that goes. So my people are anxious to get back to work. But we are here today to maybe learn something, uh, maybe something you already know. I know you're supposed to have the recipes. And if you have the recipes, that makes it a lot easier as I put things together for you, OK? So uh, without further ado, I think we should get started. So the first sauce, uh, you know, our crab cake is an interesting item. Uh, it's not a typical crab cake that's really made on the West Coast because the crab is different. We all love Dungeness crab, but this is a blue crab called lump crab, and it's a sweet crab. It's not salty, and uh, it's very well accepted uh, throughout the country uh, as a great item. And of course, we developed our own recipe, and uh, it's one of our signature items that we sell very well at the Sardine Factory. So I hope you'll enjoy uh, the recipes and enjoy the afternoon with us, okay? So I'm gonna get started. So the first uh, we're gonna make of the crab cake is gonna make this little sauce. It's not, a, it's not a complicated recipe at all. Actually, it's pretty simple. But first of all, you gotta get your peppers roasted. Now, this can be also done on the burner, or you can do it in the stove, about 400 degrees, which is about 12 to 15 minutes. And the idea of that is to really be able to peel the skin off and the seeds because we're gonna puree it, okay? And that ends up being like this. So that's the puree of the roasted peppers. So I'm gonna start putting this together. And we have about a lemon juice, about a third. And then we have mayonnaise. You know, people wonder always when mayonnaise, aioli. What does aioli mean? Aioli is really the mayonnaise base, and then you add other things to it. You might have heard of garlic aioli. You might have heard of other different names, aiolis. But basically, the base is always the same, and it's the mayonnaise. And what is mayonnaise made out of? Well, oil and eggs. And that's what you get this beautiful product. And then, of course, we've got to add some salt and pepper. And then we're going to add the, um, the puree. I'm going to mix this first. Give it a good whip. Of course, you know we're making smaller batch because we're not doing big portions here, a variety of portions. And now I'm going to give it the sauce, pepper sauce. And you get this sort of a pinkish color, if you can see that, which actually ends up being like this. So we put it in a bag, easier to decorate the plate with. That's what this is for. Okay, so we're gonna take that out of the way. So that sauce is made. 
And now we're going to make the crab mix. Now, this blue crab that's from uh, Maryland, that's where it's from, it's called lump. And it's lump because it's actually in chunk pieces. And there's also the body meat, which is the claw meat as well. They call it claw meat, part of the body, part of the claw. And then you do a mixture of this. So with this one, uh, with the lump, we have quite a few ingredients with this. So I'm gonna be very detailed about that because you need to know that. Because this probably has more ingredients than you've seen in a regular crab cake that's being done with the Dungeness menu. And believe me, I love Dungeness crab. But this was something a little different, unique, and became a big seller. So now, Pete, you're gonna hand me the, the tray. Okay. So here, that's the super lump, okay? The claw meat, all right? And for this, because we're gonna stir it with our hands, we gotta keep the sterile field, as they say. And that's because you wanna, no contamination from anybody on this. And in order to steer this, you gotta use your hand. There's probably no way, no, there's no way around that. And uh, these gloves are really something to put on. You know, during this virus, all our staff had to wear gloves and had to wear a mask six feet apart. We followed all the rules while we were open and then they closed us and here we are where we're at today. Okay, so I'm going to start now. Old Old Bay seasoning is really great if you want to boil prawns, lobster, you put this Old Bay seasoning and that's your flavor profile, which will naturally blend in well. So we put some of that there, about a quarter teaspoon, and just one whole egg, because we're making a small batch, as you, as you can see. And you know, uh, Worcester sauce is an interesting item because Worcester sauce, which I'm putting in now, when you make different sauces, little Tabasco and Worcester sauce gives it a zip. Uh, I learned that during my apprenticeship. The chef taught me that, and I still use it today if need be. Okay, and then of course we have two tablespoons of mayonnaise. as a binder, because that's what it's supposed to do. And then we have a quarter of a teaspoon of lemon juice. We have uh, half a teaspoon of Dijon mustard. And it's interesting because we end up using two mustards in this. And I don't know if any of you may be familiar with um, uh, English mustard. English mustard, in fact, when you make lobster thermidor, English mustard is in it automatically. And of course, it's a great little spice that really helps a lot. So of course, I told you about, which now we have Tabasco, just a touch of Tabasco. And we have some, uh, some parsley, just a touch of that. Then we have chives, fresh chives, not those dry chives. Fresh chives gives more flavor. And you wanna get the maximum of the flavor. That's really the idea. And this is kind of, maybe you might think this is kind of weird, but it's not. Ritz crackers. Now, why am I putting Ritz crackers? Well, there's a reason for that. A lot of them put mashed potatoes. And I think that makes it gummy. So I use Ritz crackers, a little salt in the Ritz, just normal Ritz, you know, four or five of those for this batch. And that's it. You want a little crunch in that crab cake. And then we got a little melted butter. And I got to stir everything up. 
you got to do this part first because you got to get the egg blended with the mayonnaise. And that's the base of this. And all you have to add here is your crab at the end. You don't want to add in the beginning because the crab is lumpy and you want to keep those lumps in the cake. It's very important. So I'm going to stir lightly here. Then I'm going to put the lump in. You see, most of this is made up of crab meat, if you can see. It's not a cheap dish by any means. But if you're looking for this crab, I advise you to go to the Monterey Peninsula Fish Market, wharf number two. And you see Gasper Catanzaro, who's my retired sous chef who was with me for 43 years. It's good to have him working in the fish market, let me tell you. And he's with uh, Sal Tringali, the, he's the owner of that. So what happens, you get this crab mixture, you can see it, and then from that, we're gonna form a, uh, a cake. Now, this is for two people, okay? So you either can make one big cake, which we like to do in the restaurant, or you can make two small cakes, whatever you prefer. But you could also split it in half and share it if you want. Oh, got to worry about sharing today. <laughs> better make it uh, individual. <laughs> You're better off. So I'm going to take this crab meat, and this is the base. And here's what I got to form it. Got to be tossed real lightly. There we go. So you have to kind of put it together because what you're going to do, you're going to sear this off. Oh, you can put a little wonder flour. Wonder flour is called barley flour and it's uh, not refined as refined as flour. It's very good. I've been using it for years. And just to give it a little touch on that because as it's cooking, as I'm going to do with this, I need some oil. Yeah. I don't think it's sticking in here. Put that, put that so, Pete here, my executive Sue, he's going to uh, put the, uh, going to start cooking that. So, the idea of that is we're going to sear it, but you can cook it on the, uh, the stove actually. If you want to cook it 12, 15 minutes, get it hot. I find it, by searing it, you're searing in all the juices and then finish it off in the oven. Um, that's the way I like to do it at 400 degrees. And that will give you, that will give you a, uh, uh, a nice portion and nice flavor. And you can see that how that's cooking now. So what am I doing? I'm searing it to hold it together. So we need to keep that together, Pete. Make sure that sticks it in. So, like I said, you can cook it on the, on the stove, but I like it in the stove. And uh, you put the stove about 400 degrees, and uh, that will certainly give you a real uh, cake that's warmed through. That's the most important thing. So when it's thicker, you know, it takes a little longer to make that heat go through it, even though you have a hot oven. You can have it, get it too brown on the outside, and then the inside can still be uncooked. But even though all this is all cooked, you can just eat it just the way uh, I mixed it, and you'll get all the flavors right there. So while he's cooking that, we're going to set up a plate for this. And this is going to be my, this is the one we use in the restaurant. Everything we're using today is in the restaurant. So I want you to know this is our menu. This is from our menu. But these are some of the most unique things that have the biggest draw. So I'm going to take the sauce. Sneak in a little bit. The sauce was too, too soft. Yeah, put that on. 
And uh, this is to top it. Salt and pepper. So a salt and pepper, when I say salt and pepper, I basically say to your taste, some people like a lot of salt, some people like a lot of pepper. I mean, the recipe is, uh, you know, 100%, but it's a matter what your taste is. And you could add anything you want to that to give it flavor. So we got the other one cooking. About ready. Okay. Yeah. Throw it, throw it in the oven. So we'll throw that in the oven a little bit. Even though we're cooking a little more in order to get a little ahead here on the timing. Okay. That's what we're trying to say is timing at the same time. So let's see. So I'll kind of give it a little design to the plate. Because we're going to put the crab cake right on this. And then we're going to add the, the topping to it too. Now, there's another component of that. And uh, yeah, the other component of that is, OK, yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah, you can take it out now. We're gonna take it out a little ahead of time just to show you how it's gonna be set up. So then we're making a tarragon. Tarragon and crab, tarragon and lobster is a good marriage. I mean, that's an herb that really works well, like basil works well in tomato sauce, okay? Of course, Sicilian, we make our own sauce. We use a lot of basil and basil sweeter, even though some recipes call for oregano. Oregano is actually, uh, bitter because we're getting Greek oregano here. In Italy, they have the Italian oregano, which is almost like basil. And that's why when you got recipes, say oregano, don't do it if you can't get the real thing. Use basil. That's the key. And you'll get a good flavor in the sauce. Simple. Onions, tomatoes, San Marzano only because they're the best. You go to a grocery store, you buy them. Safeway has them. Ciento, C-E-N-T-O. Uh, that means 100, and San Marzano tomatoes, best tomatoes in the world, okay? You want to show them the color? The what? Show them the color. Yeah, and that's how you want it, just that kind of a color. Go ahead and put it on there. So uh, on top of that, again, we make this uh, tarragon sauce, and, and, it's, and the sauce is uh, really uh, very, very simple. Uh, all we do is... Uh, add with the tarragon and uh, yeah, and fennel that we put on top of that. And we do this uh, tarragon sauce on top of that. All right. Okay. okay. Okay, go ahead, you go ahead. He's finishing it off just to show you. And uh, the where's the tarragon? Yeah, where's the tarragon sauce? Yeah. So. You know, the tarragon sauce is such a small, you can look at your recipe. It's not too um, complicated. And then you want to give it this shot where you're putting this tarragon sauce on top. And then you're putting this other mixture. You got, yeah, go ahead. We got it. Oops. That's plenty. Okay. So then you have it like this, okay? And that's how we serve it in the restaurant. And uh, it's, like I said, very receptive, okay? I'll put that up there. Okay, so that took care of the crab cake and that. And now, now we're going to do the house dressing. The house dressing, this is for the salad. Now, you got to ask me why I picked this. I picked it for a good reason. First of all, years ago, we opened this restaurant. Uh, we had an antipasto plate. In fact, you got antipasto, you got soup, uh, salad, entree, all one price. Well, that's prohibited today. But I had octopus on that antipasto. I took a chance to see if people would like it. Well, the people who know loved it. Other people didn't know what it was. An octopus, by the way, for your information, has no cholesterol. Calamari has about 600 milligrams 
to six ounces. That's an ounce power. So uh, you can eat a lot of octopus and not worry about it too much. And yet people think it's related. Well, it's related in a sense, okay? But uh, octopus has become very popular. The, uh, a lot of the young chefs are using it. Uh, they love using it. And uh, a lot of customers know, know it. You know, in Italian, it's called pulpo, P-U-L-P-O, pulpo. You see that on a menu, especially if you're in Europe, uh, you know it's octopus, okay? So here we go with this. This is a salad concept, okay? So I kind of played around with this salad, and we wanted to make it look really unique. Now, you can put a pound of this in there if you want. Uh, we're only going to put five ounces today to make it a little smaller. But basically, the eye appeal of the salad will still be there, okay? So let me start mixing for the octopus salad. Okay, Pete, push it up. Okay. Yeah. So, again, this particular recipe has a lot of interesting things to it to give it the flavor besides the octopus in itself. And we use Spanish octopus. Why do I use Spanish octopus? Spanish is the best. It's the waters next to Italy, Spain. There's good octopus there. There's a unique flavor to it. You go down Philippines. You go, we even have octopus in Monterey. I remember as a kid fishing, my father lay out the nets to clean them. We get about a ton of octopus, baby octopus. It was amazing. They, everybody came down to buy that and grab it, especially the Sicilians. They knew what it was. Okay. So we ready, Pete? Okay. So we're going to get going with this. And, of course, I say this is for two. Uh, so this is five ounces of octopus, what it looks like, okay? We usually do one leg, all right? And this is a pre-cooked item. I gave you the recipe of this. I can go into it, but it's a long recipe. But to get it tender, follow that recipe. If you don't have that recipe, you just contact me at the B. Catino at DeCantCountyRoad.com, excuse me. Uh, it's all small letters, and I will send you that recipe if you don't have it, okay? All right. Okay. Yes. So here we go. We're going to start making this, and what we have here, uh, about seven ounces of oil. Now, oil is an interesting thing to use. Uh, i tell you what I like to use. I like canola oil with virgin olive oil. You know what's interesting about that? The virgin olive oil is a dominant, so it dominates the flavor. So here you have, uh, like olive oil is 8% saturated fat, you're cutting it practically in half. So it's good for you, and that's the main thing. So the oil is there, and then we have a little salt and pepper, and then, what's this? That's here? the one oil. What? That's the, That's the walnut oil. Oh, the one. Yeah, uh, yeah. Now, some people are allergic to walnut oil, but walnut oil has a great flavor. And when you add these together, you're really getting a nice taste. So we have walnut oil and the combination. But I mean, if you're allergic to it, you just use olive oil in itself. And then we have thyme. You know, thyme is a great uh, herb because it really accentuates a lot of flavor when you blend it together in this kind of a concept, okay? So then we have balsamic vinegar, reduced vinegar, came into play from Modia, Italy. And I remember going there and getting in this house, and uh, as you went up the stairs, in different levels, the uh, barrels were smaller because they were aging. 25-year-old, 50-year-old balsamic. It's almost like a syrup when it's in 50. You could put it on dessert, like a gelato or something would be even great with it. And of course, a little rice vinegar. Now these combinations of vinegar, it's interesting how they come to play. And of course, the Italian rose, a little garlic. We learned to cook with garlic. And then we have a little granulated garlic too. That's to get the garlic a little more spicy. 
in flavor to accentuate the flavor. And then shallots, you know, in Italy, further you go north, it's shallots. Further you go south, it's garlic. But shallots is a cross between an onion and garlic, believe it or not. And it's a great combination. Again, flavor profile. And this one has a little honey in it, just some honey that I got to spoon out of here. And I get this honey out. And okay, Pete. Okay. And then we have my favorite fresh basil. Can't beat it. And it's for the portion, it's about uh, one tablespoon and a half a teaspoon at the same time. Then we have chickpeas. What are chickpeas? Gabanza beans. Gabanza beans in the Italian diet and also the Spanish diet. These are a must. Beans are healthy, nutritious, and good for you. Yeah. Is that it for the dressing? Tabasco. Yeah. Of course, a little dash of Tabasco again. Okay. So at this point, I'm going to mix this all together. And all you need is a whip. Don't put it in a blender. You know, you want it, if you want to put it in a blender, you're going to emulsify it. It'll come a little thick and creamy looking, but then it begins to go back to its normal self. And it's very liquidy, as you can see here. Okay. Now, the octopus, I'm advising for the cutting of it, you just start from one end. And it depends what kind of pieces you want. I'm giving you what I think is what, we, what I think is the best for the tasting of the octopus in the combination. So you're not putting a big piece in your mouth, you know, we don't want that. And so what you end up with is about this much octopus, if you can see it. And uh, okay, the dressing is ready. And now we're gonna put the salad together. This bowl is perfect, right? So we have spring lettuce. There's a mixture in here. Uh, oak and so forth because you want a little more flavor, you know, so you put that huh? four Yeah, four cups and Kiwa What's kiwa? Well, it's a it's like a grain. It's very healthy by the way and uh, uh, It's being used a lot in because uh, now people are more into health and they want the nutrition value so you put so, Quinoa, that's how you pronounce it. It's with a Q though. So I put that in there. And then we got some tomatoes. Yeah, I bought four tomatoes. And then we got the gabanza beans. And the last thing I have is the octopus. Now, it's interesting that we're using this kind of a plate. It's not a round plate, it's a rectangular plate. But there's a reason for that for the presentation. Give me the dress. Give me the dressing. Yeah. Okay. So now I'm going to put the dressing on there because we're going to toss it up. And I think that's enough right there. Yeah. I want to make sure it gets mixed up because you want to spread those the quinoa. You want to spread it all between the salad. <laughs> Sounds funny when I say that name. Uh, so I have some tongs here. Tongs, I can't get them all. It's 
So I'm kind of spreading it around a little bit here on the plate. So this is how we serve it at the restaurant. Oct octopus salad, okay? And that's one order, but you can share it for two people if you want. And of course, you want more octopus, you just put more octopus in there. Okay, so now we go to the last course. Uh, and the reason I picked this one, because swordfish uh, is a great fish and it's a non-fishy fish, you know? And really the non-fishy fish is what people want. They don't want to taste oily type fish. That's why halibut's great. Um, that's why even salmon is great. And you should eat salmon once a week. And by the way, sardines too. <laughs> that's a health food. P-H-E-A, okay? So now uh, we're gonna go with the, go ahead, bring that forward. And this is the swordfish. Yeah. So what we have to make here is the champagne vinaigrette that goes with this. And it's a, not a hot sauce, this is a cold sauce. And even some of the other factors are cold, but you know, you can serve cold and hot together. Uh, as long as it works, okay? Uh, sometimes putting stuff together like that may not work and the flavors may not come like you would like it. But I believe in uh, this particular recipe. And by the way, Jim Nance with CBS Sports, uh, this is his favorite dish when he comes to the restaurant. He usually have a party in my wine cellar, which that's a, that's a way off. <laughs> that's during the AT&T. Okay, so now we're gonna do this blending. Okay, so he, yeah, huh? yeah, the oil. So now uh, with this, because we're gonna grind things up, so it's important that uh, we put as much of it together as we can, and then we have the topping we do, which is called a tapenade. Uh, this is like chopped dry tomato, sun-dried tomato with capers and so forth. It's kind of a nice touch on size. And then we put a little palm treats, which basically is fried potatoes. You can cut them thin, cut them thick, whatever you want, and you top that off, okay? So now we're putting this together. So we're gonna, we're gonna blend this, okay? So we got uh, the olive oil, and we have a little balsamic. Huh? Right here. What's this? Yeah. This balsamic? Balsamic? No. Champagne vinegar. Yeah. This is the champagne vinegar we need in there. And we got to open the champagne. Yeah. We put the real champagne in here because champagne is from the Chardonnay grape. So uh, it's interesting when you serve this dish, if you served it all together, a nice bottle of crispy Chardonnay would be great with it. Um, or Sauvignon Blanc, but you know, a nice white wine. And it's not because you have white wine it has to be with fish or uh, red wine with meat, that's all gone now. It's whatever you want. What, you're the customer, you decide, okay? All right, so I'm getting this going. And uh, then we have, let's see, we got some mustard. Is this honey? Yeah, no honey in the first one. Yeah. Huh? No, there's no honey in the recipe. Okay. Oh yeah, right here. So now uh, um, I need the champagne. Is right here. For the champagne, yeah. Sh shallots. Okay. What's this? Garlic. Uh, we got garlic. See how garlic gets a long, a long way in many things. 
Okay. So, sure. Coach, huh? Sure. sure. And then, even though we add honey, uh, this has to be on the sweet side, but it'll be diluted with the champagne. But you put a little sugar too in it. Okay. And the honey. I'm going to put the champagne in last. which is about cup here. There goes the fizz. If you don't have champagne, you can Chardonnay wine too, by the way. I kind of like the idea with the champagne and you don't want a bitter type champagne, more or less on the sweet side. And then the half here, it's a little more champagne. That looks about right. Okay, Pete, why don't you blend that? Take it over there and blend that for me. So that's gonna be the sauce. We're gonna use a round plate for the swordfish. Now, one thing I'll tell you about swordfish, and some people may say, oh no, you shouldn't do this. But the smaller the swordfish, the more tender. Bigger swordfish swims a lot, a little more chewier. So we only buy the center cut of the swordfish, which is the best cut you can get of the, go ahead, let's keep going. And that gives you a, a great tasting fish with this combination, you can't beat it. So he's mixing that up. Uh, We'll get ready with the rest of it. Okay. Now, this is centerpiece swordfish. This is a large cut. Most swordfish is cut thinner, especially in the Italian diet, it's called rollantini, where they take the swordfish very thin and then they wrap it in breadcrumbs and so forth, and they have this breading on it. Uh, and that's, that's great too. But here, we just cook it the way it is. We add a little salt and pepper to it. You don't need a lot. Yeah, I'm gonna heat up the pan, put some oil in there. We'll give it a little of that canola uh, olive oil, virgin olive oil. Okay. Probably got to get a little hotter, but for time space, you know. And then what you do is you give a little salt and pepper on the other side. So what we're doing, we're searing the fish. The reason why we're searing the fish is to put a little crusty on it. You know, it's something we do at steaks as well. You want to sear in the juices. And since it's a big piece of fish, you want to make sure that that's going to happen. So you don't get a dry piece of fish. Now, everybody tells me, how long should you cook swordfish or any fish? What's the timing? Five minutes, seven minutes, 10 minutes? Depend on its thickness, there's a timing. If it's an inch high or half inch or quarter inch, it could be three minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, that type of thing. But I don't like just testing it that way. You get a thermometer. A thermometer, when the swordfish is cooked, you think it's ready, you stick this thermometer in it. And if it's got to 140 degrees internal, 40, 140 degrees, it's just about to the medium rare side a little bit. But you see, I would cook it at that and probably pick up another five degrees because the swordfish still keeps cooking after you pull it off the grill, just like a steak does. So you always gotta kinda undercook those things a little bit. But don't hesitate using a thermometer. You should have a thermometer in the house. You cook anything like steak and chicken and so forth. You can look up very easy on Google it and it'll tell you the exact thing that you need at what particular time, okay? All right, so now uh, we're gonna, we have here baby spinach. This is from uh, Salinas Valley. 
we're very fortunate here. We have uh, the produce industry is here is unbelievable agriculture, and we have all good things. And years ago, we didn't have that many choices we have now. Plus, you get products from Europe. I'm a little leery about products from other countries, but Salinas Valley has got the best. So what we're going to do here is we're going to heat up the pan. I'm going to put some oil in that pan as well, a little garlic, and the finishing touch is a little different maybe than people may think, but you put butter as an end, and the butter gives it a smooth taste because you have garlic and everything else you put in there, and it just gives it a very good flavor to the spinach. So, okay, so, so we're going to throw the uh, swordfish in the oven. And that's going to take about another 10 or 15 minutes because of the size of the fish. Of course, other fish doesn't take that long. And then we're going to put some oil in there. With, and you don't want to put the garlic by itself first because you, you'll burn the garlic. So what you want to do is get the oil in there, get the spinach in there. And then garlic's got to be minced really fine because you want it to cook fast. You don't want it to cook slow. You don't want it to be pieces you bite into and you bite it into raw garlic that's not the right way it's got to be cooked all the way through so at this point i'm putting the spinach in and you know spinach looks a lot when you do it that way but in reality uh it cooks down pretty good as many of you may know from your own experience so pete's stirring it up there for me and uh, then we're gonna go to, what's next we got, the tapenade. Okay, okay. So the tapenade, so, so this is what it looks like. You might, you know, the eye appeal, but it's tasty because it's got capers in it, it's got uh, pine nuts in it, and toasted pine nuts, which is important for the taste, and capers. And this all is a great marriage for swordfish. Uh, we've been doing it for years and people come back for the swordfish, especially my good friend, Jim Nance, CBS Sports. That's all he wants when he comes here. He wants that swordfish. Okay. So the spinach is almost ready. And this is ready. And we got a butter. And uh, so, you know, Actually, with these ingredients, you should, uh, you know, you, you got to chop up the sun-dried tomato first, and uh, you put it in hot water. You know, you kind of cook it for about a minute, actually, and then what you got to do is let it sit overnight, so it absorbs the liquid, and uh, the flavor profile comes out not so heavy from the sun-dried tomato, even though you want that flavor. So it works out really, really well. So now we're going to dish up the spinach first. And what we do here, the spinach goes in the center of the plate. This is the way we present it. Some people present things differently. So we put the spinach, it's sort of like a bed. Now you see the spinach really cooked down. That was quite a bit. And then we get the swordfish out of the oven. Yeah, pull the swordfish out. Look how nice it looks. The swordfish. So Pete's going to put it on top of the uh, the spinach, and uh, could have made a little more spinach maybe, but I think it's still there. Okay, and then we got our dressing. Where's our dressing? Here? Okay. Yeah, I'm going to put the top and on first. So we're going to put the top and on first. These nice, beautiful tomatoes. It goes right on the top. What is it? Champagne. 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 Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of water. Okay. It's a little thin. Yeah. So we just work it around the fish. Just don't put the sauce on top, okay? Put it on the bottom so when as you bite into the fish, you're picking up just enough flavor. You don't want to overkill uh, uh, with everything. <clears throat> Where's the pumps? And then, of course, you know, you can put a, the palm frits, you can put as much as you want. This is actually one potato, so it's more than what we need. But we just want to show you how it comes out. 
very thin, very fine, because it's a delicate dish. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we put a couple of tomatoes, and then you have this beautiful swordfish plate. This you can almost share for two people as well. But we do serve it for one, and they really love it. Okay? That's the swordfish. So here we, we got all three. Maybe I'll put them down here. Salad, the cake, and the swordfish. So I'm a quarter to three. I think I'm on time because uh, this is supposed to be an hour show. And that's how I planned it for these three courses. Oh, yeah. Um, I mentioned earlier, I recommend the Chardonnay with this uh, wine or a Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, light wine, Pinot Grigio, it's more on the sweet side, European. Um, but all that goes together very well with this fish dish, salad, and even the crab cake. So here we are. We got all three dishes done. And I'm sure there's going to be some questions that need to be asked. And I'm, yeah, I'm, I forgot the little lemon. This is a marinated lemon. Uh, some people are going to ask me questions. I'm open for that for the next five, 10 minutes. So go ahead. Somebody's asking about what? No, what? Okay. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. It's all came out well. So that's so that's our lunch, right? <laughs> Nobody has any questions. You want me to just answer a few that were given to me? Okay. Uh, questions um, for the first course. Where would you recommend sourcing the seafood in Monterey? The best source of fresh seafood that's normal that people have access to. I'm glad you, that question was asked. Now you got three places you can buy seafood. You have Whole Foods, a little high. You got The Harvest, um, they're a little lower. But I'll tell you what, and a lot of you don't even know this, or maybe some of you do, you go to wharf number two, and there's a Monterey Fish Company. It's owned by the Tringali family. Sal Tringali is the one who runs it. And my former sous chef, Gasper, is there for 43 years. He's been with me, retired now, and he's working there as well. So you, you go to the wharf number two, to that they have a retail outlet that's wholesale, and you'll get the best price in town for your seafood and the freshest. I guarantee you the freshest because we buy from them, of course. And they've always been uh, right, right on with their uh, seafood. And that's the best place. Uh, another question was, what is the best ways to tell if seafood is fresh? Not when buying a store. Well, you know, we used to get the whole fish and look at its goals and see if they crusty. That means they're not as fresh as they should be and the eyes are glazed. If you're buying filet fish, the only chance you got there is basically to smell it. And it smells really strong. You don't want that fish. And they usually be honest with you. I, I know the Tringales are. And they'll tell you uh, uh, holes that fish or it's just caught a couple of days. You know, fish can last for seven days beautifully. You wash it with lemon juice. Lemon juice takes the bacteria coating off the fish that accumulates, okay? Then another question for dish two, how do you keep the octopus or calamari for turning rubbery? Well, the best way is follow the recipe I gave you because undercooking it is no better than overcooking it. And if you overcook it, you're gonna have rubbery no matter what. So it's a little technique in cooking. Yeah, as far as the uh, crab, I, I mentioned the, um, the lump crab, of course, you can use Dungeness crab you want. You make it saltier that way. Uh, you know, for me, I like what we have because that has worked tremendously for. 
I got another question. Why the rectangular plate for the salad? Good question. Because when we put this in front of you, you look like you're getting a lot of food. And we're trying to give you a value. A value, like octopus is not cheap, especially the good ones from the, from the different areas, okay? And then dish number three, what are the types of fish we suggest with the same recipe? Uh, I would just say, you can use halibut, you can use swordfish. Uh, I mean, swordfish automatically, but I mean halibut, salmon, sole, all those kind of marry this particular presentation in itself. And those flavors will work better because why? What I said earlier, non-fishy fish, non-fishy is the name of the game. And that's what we're selling. Hard selling mackerel, it's an oily fish. Hard selling sardines, I've tried sardines in many different ways. We do have a marinated sardines, but uh, a lot of people ask for them and think we can you know, cook them up and everything, which is great, but we don't sell that many. Interesting, we're the sardine factory, we don't sell that many sardines. We actually serve a lot of abalone, and we use uh, wild abalone, not farmed. And then it says um, how you gauge the doneness. I think I gave you that, 145 degrees on the fish, about 140 uh, internal, and maybe use a thermometer. And what type of wine you recommend? I've already stated that, the Chardonnay, because that's, that's the way I would have it. Here's a couple more, that one I answered. Is there a tentative date for your reopening? I wish I could answer that. Believe me, we want to reopen. The, so that's why at this point we're closed because of the rules. Uh, we're going to put two tents outside. It'll be carpeted, chandelier. It's going to look great. And that's going to be the sardine factory. It's going to be sardine factory pavilion is what we're calling it. And uh, I think we'll be able to be a little more successful. Of course, I said I'm opening for lunch. And... What fish are locally caught, sustainable, and ready available in Monterey? Well, you got cod. There's a lot of cod caught here. Uh, salmon is sustainable. There's different farm salmons that, that basically has been accepted uh, by the aquarium, for example, because they put out a fish list, uh, shellfish rather, too, to tell you what's the best and what's recommended but they used to have first the negative and just what was the best. Now they put substitutions, which I think was a great idea. Uh, we talked to the aquarium people all about it and it, and it all understandable. And they uh, certainly um, are doing their job in relationship to sustainable seafood. And uh, we've been kind of doing farm to table <laughs> since 1968, uh, my partner and I. Uh, we believe in doing that and also regional food uh, that we thought wasn't being promoted the way it should. And we came up with different recipes. Our abalone bisque is one of the most successful. We brought it to Ronald Reagan's inaugural and uh, we served, there was 10,000 people. There were 50 restaurants doing the service. It was a wonderful experience. Uh, I would now like to turn it back over to Ron Johnson, the president and CEO of Boys and Girls Club of the Monterey County. And I just want to say, support this organization. My partner and I were members of the Boys Club, him in Brooklyn and me in Monterey. And it really makes a difference in life. So thank you very much and uh, great being with you. Thank you, Chef Bird and Chef Pete That's so good. much for that amazing incredible meal that you prepared. I'll be over in about 15 minutes, okay, to pick that up. <laughs> and uh, for anyone, has everyone uh, been to the sardine factory and had, had uh, dinner there, show of hands? Just spectacular, world-class cuisine and world-class uh, hospitality. Um, as, as Bert said, couldn't have a better, um, better host or, or a better service than the Sardine Factory. So we just thank them so much for supporting this effort. Um, and for those of you who want to uh, continue to support our efforts at the Boys and Girls Club over the summer with our nutrition program, if you'd like to make a donation online, you can do that by visiting our website. It's www.bgcmc.org forward slash summer. Um, 
And again, I just want to thank you all so much for taking the time today um, to pick up some great cooking tips. And obviously, we 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 know that Bird and and Chef Pete are masters at their at their craft. They just did a fabulous job of um, all the little detailed things about cooking. Made it look easy. We know it's not easy, but they made it look easy. Uh, but again, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. And thank you for supporting the Boys and Girls Club. Have a good afternoon.